final part of our, our Congress and uh, with our uh, closing conference by Professor Anita Vaivad. Welcome, thank you so much for being with us. I'll just say some brief words uh, to introduce Professor Anita. She's Associate Professor of Cultural Heritage Studies at the Latvian Academy of Culture. Uh, she has a background in humanities, sociology of knowledge and legal sciences and uh, where she obtained these, these titles, these, these um, degrees at universities in Latvia and France. She defended her PhD thesis on conceptualization of the intangible cultural heritage law. Uh, and she had ver uh, several responsibilities, namely in the uh, Latvian National Commission for UNESCO between 2006 and 2012. And she led a uh, Latvian delegation to the UNESCO Intergovernmental Go Committee for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. And since 2017, Professor Anita has been leading the Intangible uh, Cultural Heritage, um, sorry, the UNESCO Chair on Intangible Cultural Heritage Policy and Law at the Latvian Academy of Culture. And she has joined the UNESCO Global Network of Facilitators in the field of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, she has recently carried out uh, several projects, namely the, the, the um, a comparative study um, related to uh, national legislations, and recently, more recently another project called Intangible Cultural Heritage has Resource for Sustainable Development in Northern Europe. Uh, rights-based approach, and I think maybe we'll hear about that as well. So, please, uh, your, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Can they ask to help me out? Yeah. I, sh I should stay here. Yeah. And no, 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 I mean, so that we can see. Ah. Uh, Markus. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you indeed, and um, thank you for kind um, introductory words uh, as well. Um, I, I wish to start with uh, thanking um, Maria Filomena Gonzalez uh, for for invitation uh, to to come and to contribute to uh, to this congress. Uh, and I also wish to congratulate the University of Evora for hosting already for a decade uh, UNESCO uh, chair in the field of intangible culture heritage, which is uh, which is quite quite a significant time period if we think that it's already kind of half of the life of the uh, convention. So I think it has been quite an early decision uh, to establish um, a UNESCO chair here. Um, as it was already said, um, a UNESCO chair that I represent is uh, four years younger. Uh, what we might eventually uh, call is a little, a little sister of the chair that you have here, um, and it focuses indeed on, on cultural, um, intangible cultural heritage policies and, and laws um, in, um, yeah, in, in various countries as far as we um, study that through, through different research, um, research projects. Um, so, um, we have been discussing over these two years uh, various aspects uh, very intensely and in very uh, rich, uh, rich manner aspects which are related to um, UNESCO 2003 convention uh, in a way um, commemorating or celebrate, celebrating uh, 20 years 
since its uh, adoption. And in this regard, I would like to, uh, to dwell, so to say, on the, uh, on the notion of time um, in, in my upcoming um, speech. So um, we'll try to, to relate to some of the aspects that have been raised over these two days uh, during the presentations. Um, and I will also share some, um, to some extent, personal connections to um, various elements of intangible cultural heritage um, met, if I may say so, uh, through the processes of inventorying and listing, so both at the national and uh, international level. So I will share some, uh, some pictures, um, all of which are coming from uh, intangible cultural heritage nominations, so pictures which have been deliberately also made for the purpose uh, either to uh, make the element visible on the inventory or further on the, uh, on the national list. The first, um, the first picture, uh, which probably some of you recognize, um, uh, it comes from Portugal. Uh, it has been a nomination um, of um, manufacture of cowbells, uh, which was inscribed in 2015 on the uh, urgent safeguarding list. Um, and I, of course, it is an example uh, brought up being here uh, in Portugal at this occasion. But it is also an example that I bear um, close to some extent, um, and I kind of raise it time after time. Um, I do believe that this has been um, a nomination which in a way proves that within the, all the machinery uh, around nominating elements where you do have uh, concrete questions to answer, you do have quite a set format how to do that. You have vocabulary to use or not to use, as we learned at the, uh, early uh, on in, in the conference. Even with all this scenery set, you can still have your own writing in the way how you present the story. And I think this particular nomination has been very uh, strong and very concise, how you tell the story to some extent, even in a very, uh, if I may say so, poetic manner, uh, when we go through the text and we go through the pictures uh, uh, and we see the video, it, it all gives a little bit uh, kind of a feeling of a literary um, uh, and creative work behind, uh, behind really making the story about, um, about cowbell uh, making. But then the other reason for choosing this example is also that, for instance, this particular picture as well, it in a way captures um, the idea of time which needs to be spent uh, on, on certain practices we do. Um, either this is cowbell making in this particular case, uh, but it can also be um, work on the convention's text, for instance, where, um, as we also uh, heard early in, in the Congress, where people are involved, scholars, professionals, and they do also pass their time in thinking how we will word one or the other phenomenon, or how we will bring, build the, the consensus around what we wish to, to decide. And consensus building is specifically that I will um, use a little bit as, as a driving element through, uh, through my talk, uh, trying to see um, what aspects during the, the life of the convention, and even before, uh, what aspects have been um, consensual, well, where we really have reached a certain agreement and we move on with certain decisions taken, including conventions text. But then also in addition to that, uh, there have been non-consensual uh, issues which have been left uh, beyond the convention. And we see that to some extent, um, if the consensual side of things uh, have allowed us to move on quite rapidly with different policy development. It has been quite intense period altogether, these 20 years since the adoption of the convention. But then these non-consensual issues, uh, they are in a different temporality, if I can say so, because they do demand a certain slow, ongoing discussions, uh, which are still at this pre present moment as well. Continuing, and I will uh, come to concrete issues which are still on the table as non-consensual around intangible uh, cultural heritage. But then regarding the, uh, the time uh, and the reflection about time, it is not only uh, regarding non-consensual uh, questions that slow advancement is, is needed, but to some extent we also hear 
an appeal or, uh, or voices or, or interest uh, in slow advancement also from community side. Um, so that we sometimes also need to respect those um, calls for a different uh, time of advancement than our intentions eventually to go rapidly with uh, developing different policies and laws. So I will, I will dwell on these um, yeah, questions about time uh, and consensus building. And I will try to concentrate on, on, on two, two aspects. Um, one is, again, very much discussed, I, I have to agree so, but still um, the, the question about um, terminologies and, and uh, conceptual influence of the uh, 2003 convention. And the other one is an open question, so what does it bring or not in, 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 in legal terms, whether we do or not, uh, create some um, additional rights, obligations, and, and so on, and how do we see both of these aspects, like conceptual one, but then also kind of legal, instrumental one, um, at international and then uh, also uh, national level. And I will start by, by the international level um, in this regard. And then comes um, yet another picture. Um, we saw this picture um, earlier today, um, in the presentation, um, which were, uh, where, where legal aspects were also um, addressed. Um, and this is a picture, again, coming from a nomination, uh, this time from Brazil, uh, also proposed for the uh, urgent safeguarding list and inscribed uh, back in 2011, uh, which is quite early uh, in, the, um, in the operational uh, kind of work of the uh, urgent safeguarding list in particular. And uh, what we see here, uh, so the nomination, the title of the nomination is uh, uh, the Enawenenawe People's Ritual uh, for the Maintenance of Social and Cosmic Order. And why, why, this, picture, um, why this picture is chosen, I, I do refer now back to, uh, indeed, a personal experience um, being part of the uh, kind of decision-making setting at the Intergovernmental uh, Committee. And, and uh, uh, we discussed also these um, Kind of, what does it mean? Uh, we discussed this uh, earlier in the conference, um, and I wish to cite um, an extract of the um, uh, periodic report that was examined back in 2013. So it was a periodic report about how things are going uh, with this um, nomination. So it was two years after the nomination was uh, was inscribed. Um, so what could we read um, in this report, which was submitted by Brazil? for the examination at the uh, Intergovernmental uh, Committee. And now I cite, um, to reach the indigenous lands, uh, it is necessary to fly an hour and a half uh, from Suaba, the capital of uh, Mato Grosso, uh, to the city of uh, Yuina, and my apologies for pronunciation, in the interior of the state. From there, it is an hour by car uh, to the mooring point of the river, uh, with a further eight hours by boat uh, to the village uh, of the Enawenanawe. Even today, uh, there's almost no contact uh, between this ethnic group uh, and society surrounding their territories, a fact that makes their uh, participation in the planning and implementing of safeguarding actions difficult. However, it is worth noting that the Enawenanawe leaders make weekly telephone contact with the local office of IFAN, which is the Institute for um, Historical Heritage, uh, Historical Artistic Heritage uh, in Brazil, in Mato Grosso state. And despite their poor Portuguese, um, an exchange of information takes place regarding the actions carried out by both parties, so by state and, and by the community. So that was part of the uh, periodic report that we could read um, back in 2013, a decade ago which was brought to the attention of the Intergovernmental uh, Committee. And then those present there, part of delegations, need to take certain decision in this regard. And that was the moment when, uh, when personally I felt um, quite a strong distance between uh, intergovernmental discussions where, where governmental representatives are involved, and then indeed uh, subject matter or, or people we are talking about. And, and these geographical distances which are described here in the report 
uh, they, they also become uh, or put uh, delegations in quite an uneasy situation to, so how can we really discuss that without people being somehow involved in our discussion? But nonetheless, um, coming to the institutional, uh, intergovernmental and international level, and regarding these conceptual aspects and consensual as aspects that I was, I was mentioning. So, um, intangible cultural heritage, as, as we all know, has been indeed a novel concept um, proposed internationally through the text of 2003 convention, although similar concepts have been existing in, in other countries, um, some countries uh, previously. Um, and the concept is, is um, uneasy also from, from a legal point of view because we strongly speak about people and what people do, about certain actions, about um, people's lives and, 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 and really the way, uh, the way people act. Um, and on the other hand, there is this a little bit kind of hint of, of thought of, of property without putting that in concrete words, but still having the whole also uh, legislative experience internationally behind about cultural property, cultural property protection, and also the 2003 convention finally uh, very much relying on the World Heritage uh, Convention's text, even the way how the 2003 convention was drafted. So there was these, in a way, quite opposite uh, references, a person and a, and a property, so how, how to put all of this together in, in a novel um, legal concept. So, but anyhow, um, so intangible culture heritage as a concept was coined, and as I, as I mentioned, it, it has had and, and continues to have um, to my mind, quite a strong uh, conceptual impact. And, and just to give some examples, um, at the global um, international uh, level, we heard uh, earlier also during the, uh, the Congress that, uh, for instance, um, human right, uh, which is uh, namely uh, right to take part in uh, cultural life, has been, let's say, part of human rights early on, already from uh, United Nations Human Rights uh, Declaration of, of 1948. So that has been already for, uh, for a long time. But what has changed is that with the adoption of the convention, uh, very clearly and, and much more, we also uh, emphasize that uh, this human right uh, includes also uh, rights to intangible cultural heritage, for instance. Um, we see uh, for instance, in um, documents which are uh, at the United Nations level addressing uh, cultural rights and also addressing um, indigenous people's rights, uh, that intangible cultural heritage as a concept is very much uh, present. But that is quite, quite a recent tendency. So, for instance, uh, in the work of the um, uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur uh, on the, um, in the field of cultural rights, uh, there are intangible uh, cultural heritage issues addressed in, in these uh, reports. The same goes for the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur uh, in the field of in indigenous uh, rights. And again, intangible cultural heritage is, is very much uh, present there. It doesn't mean that um, none of these aspects would have been raised or, or deliberately uh, kind of taken care of uh, before the convention was adopted, but now with this new concept being introduced, all these different um, separate aspects and elements, they, they are brought really together under, under one single concept, and that becomes much more uh, stronger in order to advocate that intangible culture heritage is something that we would need to, to take care of. And this happens, as we see, beyond the, the way as, as convention itself uh, operates in, in UNESCO. We see similar uh, tendencies also um, at the regional level in, in Europe. And again, that was al already mentioned uh, today, where, where references were given to uh, Council of Europe, um, to uh, European Union documents, and, and we saw reference also to FARO Convention uh, earlier on uh, in, in this Congress. And if we take a look at this um, uh, FARO Convention, on, on, or in full title, uh, Council of Europe Framework Convention on the Value of cultural heritage for society, then we do read, uh, read there uh, that parties to this convention agree uh, to recognize that rights uh, relating to cultural heritage are inherent in the right to participate in cultural life. 
So it has been very clearly stated that indeed heritage matters are part of, of this particular human, human right. And we see, as for the European Union, uh, then um, indeed very clearly putting kind of side by side tangible and intangible cultural heritage is in a way constantly uh, an attitude which is visible not only in policy documents which directly address um, culture, uh, as for instance the document that was referenced earlier today about the um, integrated approach to, to cultural heritage. But we see similar um, kind of consistency also in other policies. For instance, uh, now we discuss more and more uh, the connection between heritage and climate change. So if we do take a look at the climate change uh, policy documents where they address different mitigation strategies or how we should go about it, we also do see references to uh, both tangible as well as intangible heritage. Uh, we have to say, though, that um, in the national policies which do address climate change uh, within the European region, uh, states are not that keen yet, probably, uh, to directly, explicitly say that this is also something that uh, intangible cultural heritage is concerned uh, with. But um, at the European level, we, we see that reference very clearly. And then also finally, um, regarding this international uh, level, which is not uh, less important, we have been see seeing a whole um, novel kind of disciplinary shift in scholarly uh, research. So there have been new kind of research fields opening after the convention. There have been a lot of discussions about the convention itself and what does it bring and what sort of impact it is having or might have uh, possibly in the future. So this new legal instrument has meant uh, quite a lot uh, also for the uh, scholarly uh, development. But then coming to the other side of things, be, besides conceptual, coming to kind of this legal operational uh, side of things, and that was also said earlier uh, in, in the Congress that in the end, um, 2003 convention is quite a soft uh, legal instrument. So that there are, of course, principles stated, and, and that is important. There are also some uh, state obligations uh, stated, in, including uh, establishing inventories, uh, including developing possibly other uh, safeguarding measures, including also uh, reporting uh, on what is happening within the state's territories. But we do not see any uh, clear uh, rights that would be stated, for instance, for communities, groups, and individuals. So that really uh, remains very much also um, the responsibility uh, to governments and, and national level, so what, how the convention is really put into practice and whether it comes along with clearly stating uh, or defining certain rights. But however, uh, even if we do um, see this kind of soft side uh, of the convention, uh, there is a lot, uh, there is a lot happening uh, because of the convention or having it as, as an instrument. And here, I would wish uh, really to refer um, to the inventoring, uh, which has been, we had a whole panel around inventoring in, in this Congress, and we see to, to what extent it is an instrument of power, as it was said, but then also an instrument for communities to use for their own sake, be it for the visibility or for other uh, reasons. So a lot is happening uh, for inventoring uh, within um, countries, but then also at international level. Uh, through um, uh, listing. We heard also about the, uh, the importance of international cooperation. Uh, and again, convention provides opportunity to have novel um, cooperations through, uh, um, yeah, be that listing mechanisms including, uh, for instance, through multinational nominations, but also beyond that. So this is, in a way, we, we might say that uh, having a look at this uh, convention building inventories and building lists has been this consensual part, so that, that is something that we could agree upon. However, um, if we look back um, for, at the discussions uh, before the convention was adopted, it's not that every country would have the same opinion about that. Uh, there were also opinions expressed, for instance, from Nordic countries saying that lists might, in a way, um, create some sort of competition uh, between communities, between states, and that is something that we probably do not wish. Um, but there was 
really uh, clear consensus around the interest in having inventories at the, at the national level. So that was not that much uh, contested or discussed. But anyhow, um, these uh, both yeah, inventorying and, and listing was, was adopted um, in the convention as, as modalities, how it could, how it could work. And here, here I come to the national level, or what is happening within, uh, within countries. And yet another, uh, another picture, um, which is taken from um, a nomination which was um, inscribed, uh, or inventoried, we, we might say, which is on the, on the Latvian uh, National Inventory of Intangible Cultural Heritage, and it concerns uh, Livonian uh, cultural space. And I've chosen that for, uh, for several uh, reasons, but before I say that, uh, just to give a little bit of context, uh, so Livonians um, are recognized uh, in Latvia uh, by, um, by the state as indigenous people in Latvia. Um, and this, there are several kind of eventually reasons for that. There have been different terminology used before. It has been a lot of advocacy from Livonians themselves to use this international terminology also for, for their own sake. But in any case, um, historically, uh, there have been both like predecessors of Livonians and Latvians uh, living uh, in, the, in different regions in the territory of Latvia, um, present-day uh, Latvia, and, and we have historical records about inhabitants in Latvian territory dating back from uh, 9th to 13th century, and then records about Livonians being there uh, starting from nine, uh, 11th um, century. Um, but anyhow, so there, there have been like coexistence of both, uh, which is a bit eventually a different kind of situation comparing to other countries where the notion of indigenous people uh, is used. But anyway, um, choosing this particular, uh, particular case, um, so I mentioned advocacy. Um, so having uh, the 2003 convention, let's say, uh, behind, and, and having also uh, using the reference to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, those have been references for the, this particular community to advocate for their uh, status, to advocate also for much clearer um, formulations regarding their linguistic rights and, and having much clearer policies in, in supporting uh, Livonian community. And when I say Livonian community, it, it is only a matter of about 250 people who identify themselves as, as Livonians. So it's a really tiny community who's striving to survive uh, culturally to, to maintain their, uh, their cultural identity. In that sense, they, they have succeeded to some extent, uh, but then also I've chosen this example as, as this is one of the uh, several um, elements on the Latvian inventory uh, where the notion of cultural space is used. Uh, that was a notion, notion much more used in the UNESCO context before the uh, 2003 convention. If, and if we take a look at the um, international list, we see how this concept has been fading away. Uh, there have been initially yeah, quite, quite a number of nominations using this opportunity, but then nominations are becoming much, and much more um, specific in what you nominate, which is probably also a matter that, that is eventually easier to tell about comparing to a whole cultural space. But cultural spaces in Latvia, uh, and that is a kind of side effect of, um, of um, the policy on, on intangible cultural heritage, that there, there was a separate law adopted on historical uh, Latvian lands or regions, we might say, where there is a, a policy support to different initiatives to um, preserve uh, local cultural identities. And there, uh, the, uh, the term cultural space is used in this other uh, legislative act and we see a concrete connection to the recognition of cultural spaces on the inventory and then support which is given through another instrument, uh, let's say regional cultural uh, policy instrument, which was not at all initially thought like this. So it's kind of a side, side consequence, and, and which in a way illustrates that despite firstly seeing eventually uh, kind of limited outreach of the 2003 convention, there, there might be consequences that we don't really uh, predict uh, initially, but that can lead to certain support to, to communities through other, other ways. But talking more broadly about the, um, 
the conceptual uh, impact of the 2003 convention on what is happening at the national level. Um, so we see um, that countries are taking up uh, this concept and using that in their own uh, laws, in, in their own uh, policy documents. Um, in some countries it has been before the convention, um, including, including Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Algeria. But then mostly this concept is, is really being used after the convention was, uh, was adopted. And there are different, different approaches in, in legal terms. There have been laws specifically uh, elaborated on intangible culture heritage to name, uh, for instance, in, in China, Madagascar, but then also in Latvia and, and Thailand. And then there are cases, including France, which was uh, named earlier um, in, in the Congress, where um, intangible culture heritage is referenced um, as part of heritage, as a notion integrated, but in a broader context of, of cultural heritage uh, law. So there are different, different approaches to that. Um, but in any case, um, another issue we discussed during the Congress uh, was about intangible cultural heritage domains. And, and there was a, a question asked uh, earlier whether, for instance, uh, gastronomic heritage would need to be added as, as this additional domain, let's say, in the convention. Um, although it would be quite a challenge, a whole, opening a whole legal procedure, unrealistic, I would say, uh, to change the convention as such, knowing that countries 181 has, a, has adopted, have adopted the convention's text as it is. But there are opportunities to, uh, to variate these domains at the, at the national level. And that is also what we see in different countries, that, that in fact, for instance, in Thailand, they, they have martial arts uh, mentioned as part of the intangible cultural heritage as a separate do domain. Uh, we do have also gastronomy and specific use of natural landscapes, which is mentioned in Spain um, as, as part of intangible heritage. Gastronomy uh, is also mentioned in Peru uh, as a domain, uh, but then also referencing indigenous languages um, and traditional systems of local authorities. Uh, ethnomedicine, for instance, and ethnobotany. Uh, so all of these are also mentioned as part of the intangible heritage domains. Um, in Kenya, for instance, they mention also cultural landscapes, and in Albania, uh, language is mentioned uh, as well. In other words, uh, countries can and are really doing so, uh, adopting the intangible cultural heritage concept to their own contexts and, and needs. And um, so we see, yeah, kind of variety around intangible heritage um, concept in, in, in different contexts. And then this other side uh, about the kind of legal operational manners. Um, I was mentioning uh, the Livonian case and, and the way how legislative developments in the end have led to certain creation of rights for this particular uh, Livonian community, uh, especially regarding the use of, of their language. And to some extent, sometimes it can be also so that existing rights are just really put into practice with the help of the 2003 Convention. So that some rights which have been existing, including in, in regarding you know, languages, for instance, they have been made stronger with the uh, additional argument of the 2003 Convention. But regarding um, what is happening at national level uh, and inventorying in particular, uh, there's also another aspect that I wish to mention and what we can see from um, periodic reports about um, different yeah, elements in different countries, reports that have been submitted uh, to UNESCO for examination, we see more and more um, that a lot of effort is put into inventorying. So there's a lot of documentation ongoing. Uh, there's a lot of data collected. There's a lot of, um, yeah, in, in different forms, um, including digital archives being established and so on. But in these reports, there is quite a little attention paid uh, to how these massive documentation is going to be administered or how we will manage access to data, how we will protect um, data, how we will uh, ensure uh, that there is a long-term preservation of the, uh, of the material document. And so, so this is, there's a quite, quite a little attention paid to that. And I think that is uh, something that we'll, we will need to discuss. Uh, much more, uh, much more in depth. That this is also a certain kind of legal side of things, also for inventorying, which need to be taken, taken care of. And there's different um, processes which have been ongoing in in, in countries. Uh, we have been trying to explore 
just some part of that uh, through a, a research project that we had together with the uh, French um, scholars, um, and that was um, under the title of Osmosis, and, and I'm thankful for, for colleagues also who are in, in, um, in the hall here and, and the Congress who have been contributing also to, uh, to this, uh, this particular uh, research project. And we published that uh, already um, yeah, a couple of years ago, trying to see uh, what is happening with the terminology uh, that I was mentioning in, in different countries, but then also how different connections to other fields of law are being established, be that environmental law, or be that human rights uh, law, or also intellectual property protection law. So those, those issues have been, um, have been addressed more, uh, more in depth uh, in, in, in some of the publications. And uh, earlier, also in the Congress, we, uh, we heard references to Janet Blake and Lucas Lixingsi, uh, who have been also uh, very much uh, involved in, in scholarly research about the, the convention. And, and I wished also to uh, reference uh, the commentary that was prepared, kind of commenting every single article of the uh, 2003 convention. And yet again, we were a big group of, of people contributing. Um, so um, yeah, so there's, there has been a lot to say, and, and there probably will be a lot to say still uh, in, in, in the years to come. And then um, urgency was something that we uh, discussed uh, also earlier in, in the Congress. So to what extent we do have or not uh, a clear idea, what do we mean by urgent uh, safeguarding? And this is, this is a kind of an aspect apart or specific, but, but I, I felt important to, uh, to mention. Um, and the picture here is, is coming from yet another nomination, which is uh, ent entitled um, culture of Ukrainian borscht cooking, which is the first ever uh, case of, uh, of an inscription um, on the basis of extreme urgency, uh, the only case uh, this far. Uh, the nomination was prepared um, originally as a nomination for the representative list. So that was the initial, initial uh, idea, intention, and the nomination was ready, written for the representative list. Uh, but then with the change of events that we are all uh, very much aware of, um, there was a choice by uh, Ukrainian states together with, with communities involved to, to change that and in fact to propose that nomination uh, to the urgent safeguarding list um, and uh, to ask to, for, for the nomination to be examined as a case of extreme um, urgency. So the nomination was slightly adjusted and adopted because you, so the format is different for the urgent safeguarding list, but, but that was done in, in a quite a rapid, a rapid manner, and then it was posed, and it was inscribed um, last year, um, last year on the, on the urgent safeguarding list. And this year at the committee session, uh, there will be the first report, um, because the committee asked to have the first report in one year's period, which is also extraordinary. Uh, and the first report will be examined this year by, uh, by the committee. Um, and yet again, this, uh, this case in a way shows, or, or uh, on the one hand, that there are, there are urgencies where we can raise intangible culture heritage as something important internationally, um, but then also the way how the situation can or cannot be solved, those are other arenas where that is happening. So the uh, 2003 convention, of course, can go as far as it can in, 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 in assisting, and there have been projects also in, very concretely trying to help Ukrainian refugees in, in neighboring countries, and there has been UNESCO assistance for, for that provided. Uh, but still, it, it probably doesn't solve the, the, the urgency situation as such. But then also, um, regarding this case, uh, there is another aspect of this um, international conceptual impact that I wanted to raise, um, in addition to what I was mentioning previously, um, if we take a look um, at, yeah, international courts uh, operating, and here I, I think in particular about uh, international criminal court, as that has been also discussed, is eventually regarding Ukraine, and, and there's a process ongoing at the international criminal court. Uh, if we take a look at, at a policy document that has been um, elaborated by the International uh, Criminal Court's Office of Prosecutor, um, there was a policy document on cultural heritage, uh, 
which was issued in June uh, 2021. And in that document, very clearly again, it talks about, uh, and it gives example of previous uh, cases where um, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, uh, genocide uh, crimes, that regarding all of this, uh, it concerns not only, for instance, the destruction of, of cultural heritage sites, the, the tangible side of things, where we do have um, also a court case very clearly where uh, criminal responsibility has been there because of the destruction of heritage sites in, um, in Mali, for instance. But then what this policy document emphasizes is that we need to take uh, a close look also how um, what, what um, different military situations and, and wars ongoing and so on, what does it mean for intangible uh, cultural heritage? In other words, that there is criminal uh, liability also regarding uh, crimes uh, that are there uh, that affect uh, intangible cultural heritage safeguarding. And that is, I think, an, an important reminder. We will see to what extent it, it, it also affects, for instance, uh, gathering of evidence and so on regarding this particular case, but in, anyhow, uh, it is yet another, um, another way how intangible cultural heritage has been emphasized. And again, it doesn't say that uh, no attention to these issues have been uh, there before the 2003 convention, but having a single concept for that, it, it makes discussion about that very um, uh, much more stronger. Um, and a final picture uh, that I have, um, and I hear I would like to come to this um, uh, this lowliness side of things, uh, or, or aspects that have been um, non-consensual and that still demand um, some, uh, some discussions. And here in particular, the, the picture that I have co chosen, that comes from um, um, Intangible Culture Heritage Inventory, uh, which is in the form of wiki inventory in Finland, and, and it concerns uh, Sami, uh, indigenous people, um, and in this particular case, it concerns uh, Sami uh, handicrafts. Uh, but as we know, uh, Sami indigenous people are, are spread ac across four countries, um, Norway, Sweden, and then also Finland, and, and also Russia. Um, why this particular choice, uh, choice and, and how do that, uh, that relates to, to the discussion around the convention? Um, more, more broadly. Um, so there are two uh, non-consensual aspects that I wanted to raise um, where the discussions are still ongoing and where the discussions have been there already before uh, the 2003 convention. Uh, one of these aspects is the protection of intellectual property uh, rights and the other aspect is uh, rights of indigenous peoples. Um, these are not the only aspects that we might be discussing but these are two I, I wish to uh, propose um, today. Uh, regarding intellectual property, um, it is interesting to, to see back what, what, what was the kind of the origin, to some extent, of the 2003 convention. Um, and um, the work of, of scholar Waldemar Hafstein was also referenced earlier uh, today. And, and he has been very closely looking into a story behind the convention, which dates back to 1973 and a letter from Bolivia, um, which initiated a whole discussion. And I just wanted to, to cite uh, some part of, the, of, the, of this particular uh, letter. Uh, we can read there uh, that cultural expressions as music and dance being threatened by intensive commercialization and export, transculturation, uh, with no proper indication of the origin of concrete cultural expressions, uh, an idea of an international register of folkloristic cultural property uh, was something that, that was proposed by this um, uh, letter from Bolivia. Um, later on, uh, in 1982, uh, where already uh, a concrete instrument was discussed, uh, which took form later as, as a recommendation, which was referenced uh, early in the Congress, recommendation about the, on the safeguarding of traditional cultural and folklore. Um, before it was adopted, uh, we read, for instance, um, uh, a writing by, by Professor Lauri Honko, who, is, uh, who was folklorist, uh, from Finland, um, and back then in 1980s, uh, folklorists were quite influential in, in decision making at UNESCO, and he was leading the, uh, the expert group who were working on the um, recommendation of 1989. But back then in 1982, he was writing, 
It is necessary to consider ways in which the bearers and users of tradition can be defined and supervised so that the economic gains can be channeled back to the societies to which the traditions belong. Um, and to some extent, I think there is even a sort of connection with the ethical principles that have been adopted like three decades um, or more even later. But those were discussions early, early on, but the intellectual property uh, issue altogether was left deliberately uh, outside the 2003 convention because of this very much non-consensual aspect of it, uh, characterized, for instance, by what is happening at the World Intellectual Property Organization, where no decision is really properly being reached on, on how a traditional knowledge could be protected. There are intentions, also regionally, for instance, uh, discussions ongoing between Finland, uh, Norway, and Sweden, whether at the regional level there might be a convention adopted how to protect Sami traditional knowledge. But yet again, it is not a consensual matter yet. So it, it might still take, take time. And the same goes to discussions about the rights of indigenous uh, peoples. And if we take a look at some of the writings um, of people involved, um, legal scholars uh, who have been also part of the um, work on the 2003 Convention's text, then, for instance, Paul uh, Kuruk, um, who has been one of the legal experts, has named uh, the Convention as a missed opportunity, uh, so that it doesn't really give concrete instruments for indigenous peoples to defend their interests and rights in the cases of misappropriation and unauthorized use of, of their, their heritage. But then we also read, for instance, what, uh, what Janet Blake writes, um, who has been also very much involved in, in writing the, the 2003 Convention and in, in the work afterwards, uh, where she says that it has been a compromise position, uh, the text of the 2003 Convention, so that to keep also those countries on board uh, who are in general interested in, in, in tangible culture heritage safeguarding, but who are not that keen in, in really putting very clearly what would be the solution to propose legally for indigenous peoples rights issue or for rights issue more, more broadly. Anyways, um, coming to um, concluding and, and yet thinking about, about time, um, and this was another reason why I chose um, to, to mention uh, Sami. Um, so I have been trying to observe discussions uh, over the last years around uh, Sami intangible culture heritage um, safeguarding, what discussions have been ongoing in, in the Nordic countries, uh, whether a common inventory could be uh, established between um, the countries as a cross-border inventory. Uh, that, is still, that is still being discussed. Uh, but anyhow, um, in these different contexts, uh, different formats of debates, exchanges, and so on, um, there was um, an acknowledgement or, or a feeling or, or a statement which was repeatedly there from uh, representatives of Sami communities. Uh, and that was, to put it um, shortly, that we need time. Um, we need time to discuss. Uh, we need time to reflect. We need uh, time to take a common decision that would suit all of us, for instance, in the case of Sami that would suit Sami communities across uh, the borders. And this reminder uh, that we need time in, in a way um, kind of wakens and, and, and says that probably indeed uh, there are different temporalities. There is there's the one of, of policy making where we probably wish to move on with certain periods, with certain reporting or other periods, with certain decision making on how inventories should be established, how the engagement, how active it should be. Uh, but there's also this other temporality of, of those who are really uh, practicing uh, their lifestyles and, and, and really willing to, to safeguard for their own sake, um, uh, despite uh, these other temporalities which are existing all, all around. And, and I think that, that was an important, um, in a way, uh, reminder. So uh, having said this, and, and taking back a look at, at those aspects that, that uh, I tried to raise um, at this occasion, so there have been uh, quite an intense uh, changes, we might suppose, after the 2003 convention being adopted on this conceptual 
uh, impact side on the consensual uh, side of things where we have been agreeing about uh, certain aspects, but there are also issues which have been deliberately uh, left behind, but to which we are coming back. And, and we see that, for instance, intellectual property issues and also now indigenous people's issues, they are now being more and more raised in documents which are accompanying the 2003 convention. So there's a convention text which probably will stay as it is, but there's a whole set of documents which are being elaborated uh, afterwards, and, and that is the way uh, how we see the dynamics around the 2003 convention, uh, where new content is put in these new uh, documents. And to mention another one, in addition to the document that's already mentioned around um, uh, good safeguarding practices, which will be discussed uh, uh, at the committee session this year, but then another uh, aspect that, that will also be on the agenda is, for instance, about the economic dimension of intangible cultural heritage, and again, ethical issues around it, misappropriation including, that I was mentioning earlier, which leads back to kind of slight side of, of reflection about, again, these intellectual property or, or uh, indigenous people's issues as well. So we see much more kind of awareness uh, about these silenced aspects previously, uh, much more is now brought uh, brought up, uh, including issues of um, inclusivity, and uh, which comes very much in connection with the discussion about sustainable development aspect. So having said all, all of this, I, I think there's a lot still to, uh, to be done um, around the 2003 convention on these non-consensual aspects, but then also eventually other, eventually completely novel aspects that will be uh, raised. And, and yet again, I think it's, it's it's good to remind to ourselves time after time that there might be these different uh, temporalities uh, existing and, and that the way how time can be perceived uh, regarding intangible cultural heritage can be in, in different manners and should be uh, respected as, as such. Thank you for your attention.